We're lucky enough to have uh, Ruth Milner with us, who's the regional biologist for Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, which takes care of all of the San Juan Islands, among other areas, and to come in and talk to us about deer, deer management, um, some of the implications of deer overpopulation. Um, we're not really here to talk about what we're going to do, we're just here to educate people and have public discussion. So I hope we have people <coughs> here that are interested in deer on, um, from both sides of the, of the story. And um, she's going to talk, we're going to show a little bit of Peter's uh, video of Peter's talk. I apologize, we have small speakers, so we're going to have to be pretty quiet to hear them. But you can get the entire presentation for free on the CDOC website. And, and then Ruth is going to um, give us some background, and then we'll just have her open that up to discussion. So thanks all for coming. Just a big round of applause for Ruth. Thank you. The, the idea here is that uh, the longer deer have been on these islands, the more dramatically vegetation is reduced. And you can see that per quite strikingly in the plot, but you can see it much more strikingly just in a picture like this. When we think of Haida Gwaii, these people from BC, we think of big open areas with bryophyte understories, huge trees and openings. Well, that's not the natural state in Haida Gwaii. That's a state that is deer-induced. And it looks like on the right there, that's an island, uh, reef island, uh, with very high deer densities. And that's Steve Allenbear standing on a deerless island, one that hasn't had deer right next door. And so the Haida Gwaii that we didn't know about uh, was the one free of deer, which you can only see in a few places where deer haven't yet come, or in a couple places now that are recovering after deer have been removed. This is kind of a direct effect of deer on vegetation, but it has very strong indirect effects on other kinds of species. You can imagine that if you remove the shrub understory, you're going to affect a lot of the species that rely on those kinds of things. And so if you look at a bird community, you might expect that the ones that depend on shrubs and ground areas for nesting and feeding might be impacted. And not surprisingly, if you go and survey birds in these areas, you find big declines in the abundance of these species which depend <clears throat> on that layer. And the same is true, and I could show you data on pollinators, invertebrates, other kinds of things which are linked. So very strong effects, in this case, of introducing deer and having trickle-down effects to the rest of the system. What we do know in the Georgia Basin in our area from uh, pioneer records and others is that predators were common, abundant, super abundant in this area, so much so that they were a real problem for people who were bringing livestock to the area in the future. You'll see lots, or, or, or who brought livestock area to the areas with them. And so you see lots of examples in the Salt Spring Museum of uh, stories about uh, 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 problems settlers had had with cougars cougar skins and other things, and we know now that they've mostly been re uh, removed from the area. Well, one of the things we've been doing over the past few years is looking in this area, the dark gray there, which is the southern, southeastern part of Vancouver Island. You can actually just see orcas down in the, in the uh, light gray there in the very bottom right, and there's some different colored dots, and that's because we put in plant plots in some of these places. We do a lot of uh, bird counts. We'll, I'll, I'll show you about to a census bird communities and we also um, census other kinds of things. And so for a long time we've been looking at the biological com the communities that exist on islands with and without deer and with different densities of deer to try and ask if the same kinds of things that we've seen happen in the Midwest <clears throat> or in cases like Haida Gwaii where deer have been in introduced also uh, happen in our area. And uh, they do. This is Mesha Island. Some of you will know that very close by. Uh, very typical kind of an island with a very thick understory. Very much like Haida Gwaii without deer. Uh, that's that picture of Steve Allenbear there. Here's Sydney Island, which is just off Sydney. This is an area where we don't just have a very abundant black-tailed deer. We also have fallow deer, which are an exotic deer, which has in, been introduced and is actually spreading quite rapidly through the Gulf Islands right now. I don't think it's in the San Juan Islands. It is? It. On to Spiden, right. There's a lot of stuff on Spiden. <laughs> used to be rhinos on Spiden. Um, <clears throat> and when you look at this, you might say, oh my gosh, deer can't do this. But they can. We put an exclosure up in 15 years. Uh, this is what you get coming back. Uh, you get a dramatically different community uh, with and without deer. And again, the community is uh, one that's uh, quite, uh, which isn't just supporting plants, it's supporting all of the species with it. 
But still, of course, we'd like to know, you know, what is the natural state of this ecosystem and can deer really be driving uh, biodiversity loss uh, to the degree I'm suggesting? I'll just show you a little bit more uh, to uh, suggest that we're pretty convinced this is the case. Um, just two summers ago, I had some undergrads uh, doing a simple experiment looking at the palatability of shrubs to first find out what deer like to eat and then make predictions about based on what they eat, do we see... Can we okay, you have to go watch the whole video. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm Sorry, I know you guys were really getting into it, but Ruth is a great speaker. <laughs> we're going to leave you hanging. We're going to uh, put, turn Ruth on, and that video is free, and so um, you can go to, to that uh, website and download that. But I just wanted to give that introduction kind of some continuity of history of, of uh, why we have Ruth here tonight talking. So, Ruth Milner. All right, thank you. Well, thank you all for coming. So, uh, as Joe said, I work for the State Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. I'm a district biologist, and my beat is uh, Island, San Juan, <coughs> and Snohomish counties. And I also claim the Skagit County Islands in the archipelago. And I've been doing this job since 1992. So, uh, I want to take time and invite you to have a conversation this evening, but before we start asking questions and providing ideas, I thought I would give you um, some basic information so that we're all starting out on the same page. So let's start with black-tailed deer basics first. Um, th these animals are, this is the, the deer species in western Washington. So it ranges from the Canadian border down to Vancouver on the west side of the Cascades. They have small home ranges. They generally form family groups and not large herds. Um, they have a ruminant digestive system, which means that <clears throat> they're, uh, uh, they have a four-chambered stomach that is adapted to help them digest difficult things with the microbes in the gut, including things like cellulose. And they tend to browse on brush and plant materials rather than graze. It's a little different than an elk, which you'll see in meadows, and they prefer to graze uh, on grasses and, and um, uh, <coughs> low-growing vegetation. And as we know, the populations on the islands are very high. So, in the San Juans on Orcas Island, deer are native. If you watch Peter's entire presentation, he will uh, present information that says farther to the north in the Canadian islands, they were actually introduced. But here in the islands, they're native, they belong here. Um, and uh, they have been uh, traditionally, prior to the arrival of white settlers into these communities, their populations were controlled by a variety of pred predators, as Peter suggested, including things like cougars, wolves, and bears. The last wolves that we have documented, uh, there's a, a point on Lopez, a document that suggests that the last wolf was taken off Lopez in about 1860, 1865, somewhere in that range. And this was not unique to the islands. This was very typical uh, in the American West as people moved west with the uh, Homestead Acts coming out to settle. Predators were competition to livestock and so they were removed. And in an island ecosystem such as these, where these ecosystems are small and isolated, it didn't take very much to remove them all. With the removal of um, these predators, we've seen the deer population increase and <clears throat> for the last 100 plus years. So on the islands, um, typically what you would see, especially in the more healthy places uh, in the islands, if you can find them, is that you'll see small family groups that are usually comprised of does. They're often mothers and daughters or sisters. Young bucks will move in and out of those groups, and occasionally you'll see groups, depending on the time of the year, groups of younger bucks together, uh, and the older bucks will move around a little bit more, tend to be a little bit more solitary. On the mainland, a typical home range, and by home range I'm going to define this as that area that the animal, animal occupies, which provides it with all it needs to sustain life. So that would be food, cover, uh, water, and a sense of security. And in the islands, black or excuse me, on the mainland, black-tailed deer have small home ranges, usually from about a half mile squared to maybe two miles squared. 
Um, on the islands, Dr. Eric Long, who is with Seattle Pacific University and is probably, besides Dr. Archis, has the best research and data for deer in the islands. He's estimated on Blakely that a uh, typical home range of a doe is about 50 acres and a buck is slightly larger, about 150 acres. And these home ranges overlap. So you can have several groups of deer occupying tiny little home ranges overlapping, <coughs> which tells you that there isn't a lot of food cover and water to be found in these places when you get too many deer. The males go walk about during the rut, which is typical of most ungulate species. Uh, in the islands, they will um, head out for about a period of a month in October, November, December-ish. Uh, they'll go out, range around, find a female in estrus, and then they come immediately back to their home range. And this is likely because they're nutritionally stressed and they're trying to conserve energy. So they pop out, get the breeding done, pop back, rather than spending a lot of time ranging out and looking for females. Um, Eric's work has shown that there's limited immigration, um, out migration from one island to another. These, isle these deer tend to be born on these islands. The, uh, the deer born on Orcas will, uh, will stay on Orcas for almost all of their lives. Um, and recolonization, when you take animal deer out of a particular area, is very slow. So that doesn't make sense. If they never leave, how did these islands get populated in the first place? And we know from research on white-tailed deer and some research in Alaska that probably about 20% of animals in a population will occasionally range out and go pioneering. And I think of them as similar to human populations where people who are willing to take risks are the folks that are the ones that are jumping off cliffs in those human kites. And the rest of us are content to um, stay where it's nice and warm and comfortable in our homes. So that risky behavior probably triggers a few animals, maybe 20% of a population occasionally, to go out and pioneer and find a new place to live. So this is how these islands, when the predators, as uh, Peter alluded to, removed them from some of the smaller islands, how they got back there. The other thing we know is deer do swim. And Eric has had a couple of collared bucks who took off from Blakely, swam to another island during the rut, and then swam back. <laughs> And the predators swim too. How did predators get here in the first place? They're pretty good swimmers when they have to be. So we know that populations here are very high. Dr. Archis estimates probably 10 times higher than um, pre-settlement conditions when predators were also part of the ecosystem. Um, but specific estimates for the islands do not exist, and I know that really frustrates people. People want to know how many deer are there on the islands. Again, Dr. Long on Blakely has got a 10-year data set and has experimented with a couple of different techniques to survey deer, and he's come up with an estimate of around 650 to 670 deer on Blakely Island, and that island is six and a half miles square. Very tiny island. So um, why do we not, whoops, let me go back one. Why don't we have population estimates for, for deer here? Um, Black-tailed deer are really hard to census. There is no agreed upon good census technique for black-tailed deer anywhere in Washington or Oregon. The photo on the left here are white-tailed deer. White-tailed deer tend to inhabit more open types of habitats and they tend to group up in herds and so you can get in an aircraft like a helicopter and you can fly over and you can count them and you can do this repeatedly and you can come up with a population estimate. Black-tailed deer ideally by uh, adaptation are more typically a forest deer and, so, and they don't group up into large herds. And so it's very difficult to figure out how to find a creature that really is rather cryptic in the forest and occurs in small, sporadically distribu distributed um, uh, groups. So 
I don't know how many deer are on Orcas, and I don't know how many are in uh, the islands. But we can infer from, as Dr. Arcees pointed out, I'm going to call him Peter so I don't stumble over his name. Um, we can infer that our population is higher than it was originally and higher than it should be by uh, assessing local conditions. So one thing we know, um, where there are too many deer, you do not have an understory. And as Peter alluded to, when you remove that understory, you are removing the diversity of all the other creatures that depend upon it. So the numbers and the variety of birds that live in these forests goes down. The number and variety of amphibians and reptiles probably does as well, and even insects. Um, the other way we can infer that our population is too high is to look specifically at the condition of the deer themselves. In the islands, we know that most individuals have very little fat on them. Um, they tend to be smaller than the mainland animals. They're very small and they tend to grow very slowly. If you look at uh, the teeth of an animal that should be a yearling, typically it's more likely to have the tooth dentition of a two-year-old animal. Nutritionally deprived, they grow very slowly. Um, few to no twins are produced and the mortality rate on twins is about 50%. And we don't know if this is because the females are so nutritionally deprived that they simply can't um, provide enough milk to the young fawns when they're first born or whether they just kind of abandon them because the choice is I keep myself going or I sacrifice my energy and nutrition to my fawn. So. That's deer biology 101 as we understand it now in the islands. <clears throat> I'm going to switch now and I want to talk a little bit about humans in the landscape and the complexity of us as a society, as social beings, to try and understand um, attitudes and values. And we all have them and they're very, very complex. So when it comes to hunting, and I will point out that my agency is the agency that regulates hunting in the state of Washington. Um, so my agency advocates hunting um, and they advocate responsible hunting. When it comes to hunting, there are lots of different values that when you ask people, what do you value deer for and do you hunt or do you not? And oftentimes the hunter will say, I just want meat in my freezer. Good, healthy, unadulterated meat in my freezer. Someone else might say, I really love the chase. I want to take my family out. I want to introduce them to this, um, this sport, if you will, and to the wild conditions in which the animal I seek lives. Other people just think deer are just plain cute and fuzzy. They just like seeing them. They just enjoy knowing they're out there. Some people regard deer in the same um, light as they do their dogs and cats. And this is very typical. Um, the, the value that this animal is wild gets kind of morphed into this wild animal I love in the same way I love my dog or my cat. And to other people, they're just plain demons. They're in my garden, they're eating my roses, they're coming up on my porch, they're banging down my greenhouse, I just want them gone. And in my world, I deal with people who have all of these values and attitudes. So I want to just take a step back for those who are not familiar with the history of wildlife management in this country and just give you a really quick synopsis of how we got where we are in um, the regulatory world of hunting. And this goes back to our European and British ancestors. Back in the day, uh, in those countries, early on, game belonged to the king. Uh, the king's game was bestowed upon um, the wealthy, whose people, who, individuals that the king bestowed land on. The landowner, by virtue of the king's good graces, owned all the game and wildlife. And if you were a 
person who lived on that land but did not own it and you chose to harvest an animal without the king or the landowner's permission, it was up to them to decide your punishment. And they, if they so choose, they could put you to death. When our ancestors came to the New World, they said, we don't want to live that way. This is a wide open country. As we all know, they claimed it from the folks who were here. And the first thing they said was, the king's game now belongs to all of us in society. And that's the history of how we got to public ownership of wildlife. Mm -hmm. The landowner does not own the wildlife in our country or in the state of Washington. You, the public, do. So moving on a little bit in time, in the early 1800s we had what was called market hunting in the United States. This was wholesale, go out and catch everything you can in any amount you want. Feathers were taken back and sold to the haberdashery industry back east for fancy hats for ladies. Uh, all different kinds of birds and mammals made their way back east to the fancy restaurant tables of Chicago and New York and places like that. Uh, you've all heard about the extinction of the passenger pigeon, which was shot to extinction by market hunters and just wholesale unregulated hunting. As a result of this, um, the North American, what we call the North American wildlife conservation model was developed. And what this said was, wildlife belongs to all of us as a public resource. And sustainable populations through hunting is the way we are going to manage this public resource henceforward. And that was the genesis of hunting and fishing regulations and rules in this country. And it survives to this day. And these are um, tenants that are held near and dear to the hearts of most hunters, as well as many non-hunting members of the public. We once were an agrarian rural society. And in those days, most people augmented their diet through hunting and fishing. And um, the idea that uh, an animal could not be hunted because I related to it more like my pet than a wild animal that's going on my table was kind of a foreign concept up until um, at least through World War II because most people lived on farms and had a pretty utilitarian attitude towards animals in general and wildlife. Um, but demographics have changed and just in this era, uh, you know, we now know that two, or three, two out of three rural counties between 2010 and 2014 lost population as people moved to the cities. And hunter numbers have declined by 2.2 million individuals between 2011 and 2016. And this is largely due to changing values, changing attitudes, how people choose to spend their time, how they relate to the natural world. Uh, in this day and age, all of us in one form or another tend to relate to the natural world through a screen of some kind. It can be a windshield, a cell phone, video, television. We're kind of one step removed because we're not making our living on the land as um, our grandparents probably did. So some facts about hunting. Um, as I said, Department of Fish and Wildlife, where I work, uh, is the agency that is charged with managing wildlife in this state. And we are charged with um, managing hunting, hunting seasons and regulations. And this is done by our commission, which is a body of individuals appointed by the governor to oversee how the Department of Fish and Wildlife is run. And by law, only the Fish and Wildlife Commission can set the time, place, and manner of hunting. The landowner, however, can control access. So people who disagree with hunting, who don't want hunting on their property, they are the people who can say, no, I don't allow it on my property. They cannot, however, regulate how many animals might come from their property or when those animals might be taken. That's set by the state. And deer hunting is regulated by season, by weapon type. There are three central weapon types uh, in Washington. Modern firearms, which would be rifles and shotguns, archery, bows and arrows, and primitive weapons called muzzle loaders. Um, the commission sets the sex of the animal that can be harvested, the time it can be harvested, and the number that can be taken. 
And for deer hunting, hunters are required to report online um, what they, whether they hunted, if they bought a license in a given year, and what they took if they harvested an animal. Um, all persons born after 1972 in the state of Washington are required to take a hunter education course. And this course is designed to teach hunter ethics and hunter safety. Firearm restrictions occur in the San Juan Islands. What that means is nobody can hunt any animal in the San Juan Islands with a rifle. You can use a shotgun, usually with a lead slug in it, a bow and arrow, or a primitive weapon or a center-fired pistol. And this is because we recognize that these are small places and there's a safety risk. And so the, by design, these weapons are selected because they don't uh, travel as far as a bullet fired out of a rifle will. Um, and in this county, by county ordinance, not by state law, Landowners um, have the privilege, hunters are required to get written landowner permission before they set play, foot on a piece of property to go hunting. So on orcas, um, our general seasons, as I said, are broken down by weapon type. And you can find more about this in our game pamphlet, which is available online. And I brought a, I brought a few tonight if people haven't seen them before. And the seasons run kind of a long time. They generally start September 1st and basically go through the end of December. But they're blocked out according to weapon type. Um, so there's an early archery season, and then there's a general archery season, and there's a modern firearm season, and then there are late seasons, and so it goes. And in this um, county, we have what we call second deer tags. This is a permit hunt where hunters actually uh, put in a lottery and if they're selected they get a second tag to hunt. During the general season any deer can be taken, so does or bucks. During the second deer season um, only does can be harvested. And we have this second tag in the islands because we are trying to make some population reductions out here. So these numbers, uh, right now in 2016, we had 40 permits for modern fired arm hunters for second deer tags. We had 74 people put in for the lottery for those. We issued 25 archery tags, 40 people um, put in for those tags, and 25 were selected. And then we had 20 muzzle loaders and only nine people put in, so those nine people got their tags. Um, Figuring out how many animals are harvested island by island is um, something that is just causing me to tear my hair out. Traditionally, all of the San Juan Islands, plus Whidbey Island and Camano Island, and a couple of the, most of the Skagit County Islands, were all lumped into a game management unit numbered 410. And it's been that way for probably 30 years or more. Four years ago, we changed that and we assigned individual game management units by island. So Orcas Island is game management unit number 411. And we did this because I want to know, island by island, how many deer are being taken through hunting. The problem is hunters are creatures of habit and a lot of them have the same place that they go to year after year after year. And they don't bother to read the pamphlet. And so even though we do everything we can to get the word out that you need to look and figure out which island you are hunting on and which new game management unit number applies to it, mm -hmm. they still are reporting game management for unit 410. So in 2016, they reported that they took 190 deer out of there. Well, the problem is game management 410 is all the non-ferry islands, small islands that are left after we assigned individual numbers. It's basically Stewart Island and maybe a couple of others. So I know that's not true and I know it's just because my hunters are not um, figuring out that, that we've changed the game management unit. So if you're hunters and if you know hunters, please help me spread the word. So we also have uh, in my agency something called the Private Lands Access Program. This is a program that um, is designed to help us get more access 
not only for hunting but also for wildlife wash, watching on private land. And it is primarily geared for hunting. It's been very successful for waterfowl hunting over in the Skagit, Stiligwamish area. Um, we have a biologist who can come out to a property and assess whether or not it's a safe place to hunt. Uh, he can um, tailor hunting access according to what the landowner would like. So if you only want an, two hunters to come on Wednesdays, he can set it up so that that's the way it's going to be run. If you only you own 40 acres but you only want them hunting on that 20, he can set it up that way. We can pay up to $1,000 a year for hunting access. And so far in the islands, no one has taken us up on this. We've got one property that we just enrolled down in the Stanwood area on the mainland, and it's a five acre piece. And the lady wants the deer thinned out there. She's really struggling to keep her property up. So um, Rob, our, our private lands biologist, is setting up a blind. So the hunter can only go to that blind. They cannot move around her property. And he's setting it up so that um, hunters who want to go there have to have written permission from the landowner. This gives her an opportunity to meet the hunter and decide that yes, this person can come on my property. We have other techniques from feel free to hunt where anybody can go. Um, we have reservation systems that specify how many people and when and they reserve the slot so that the landowner is aware that um, they're never going to be overrun by people. So why can't we get people to sign up for this program in the islands? And it, there are a myriad of reasons and they come down to value like everything else uh, in the world does. Some of the reasons we've heard are, you know, I'm not opposed to hunting, but my family and friends come here and I don't want to ruin the opportunity for them. I've already got my program up and running and it's working for me. I get a lot of, I'm not against hunters, I'm just against off-island hunters. And I get this on every island I work on and my counterpart in King County gets it too. There's just a real sense that the people who live in my community will do the right thing, and the people who live on the mainland, those are the beer-swilling bad guys that are going to come do terrible things on my property. They're not bad guys, they're not all beer-swilling, but I have yet to crack that attitude among a lot of landowners. Some people would love to have deer taken off their property, but they don't want to make their neighbors angry. They know that their neighbor loves the deer or their neighbor might be intimidated, whatever. A lot of people think it's not safe. Um, I've looked and I cannot find any hunting accidents in the San Juan Islands. Um, they may have occurred, I can tell you for sure there are no fatalities, um, but we couldn't find any records when we dug in into it a little bit. Um, but I get that uh, it's a perception. And it's a particular perception among people who don't hunt. Um, and that bleeds into, I just don't like guns. If you're not familiar with them, or if you've had a bad experience, um, we are a country that is very divided on the gun issue, and that bleeds over into the hunting issue. And I understand why. Um, and then there's the, I just plain don't believe in it. I don't want to see wild animals hunted. So if the population's too high in the islands, what do we do about it? And I'm open to your suggestions. I'm really hoping that uh, we can get into a conversation tonight. Um, some of the things that have been suggested. Well, catch a bunch of them and relocate them. We just tried to call our 20 blacktail bucks for a research project that we're initiating on the mainland. Um, it took all, uh, I think there's what, 12 of us on the, on the 12 district biologists on the west side. Um, we were all out looking for bucks and um, carrying dart guns and uh, setting traps out. One guy was successful in catching a buck by land. Uh, they're just really hard. So our Ch Cliff Rice, our researcher, spent $35,000 to bring a helicopter crew to come in and call our 20, 20 deer. So the idea that we're going to catch 
and move deer. First of all, it's outrageously expensive. It's a lot harder than you would think it would be. And the most important thing is where are we going to put them? Um, the general tenet of habitat is if it's good habitat, it's occupied. And when you move animals around and it's occupied by somebody else, they're not likely going to survive, especially animals in the basic general condition that animals out, that deer out here are in. Um, a, a relocated animal has to have resources that get them through that search and familiarity um, time period where they're even figuring out where they are, what's happened to them, and how to survive. What about sterilization? This is a favorite of many, many people. It's been tried in many different ways uh, on white-tailed deer back east, and nobody is saying it's successful. First of all, you've got to get them all. So now we've got this problem with this animal that likes to hide in the woods that you can't find. To be successful, you've got to get them all. Um, and uh, the techniques that are available just haven't worked. There's a paper that's pretty recent, um, and I think it's from the Midwest. And they did an experiment where they um, surgically sterilized a bunch of does. And what they found, and then they set up cameras to see um, over time what happened. And what happened was the does dropped out through time, and the bucks just showed up all over the place. They don't really know why, but one theory is, you know, when you've got females in estrus, the bucks keep each other sort of spread out because they're territorial and they're competing. Now you've got these lonely young bachelors seeking a mate and there's no one out there. And so uh, the, the problem did not go away. It just shifted to bucks causing problems rather than bucks and does causing problems. What about sharpshooters in a culling program? Well, you get the society on Orcas Island together and tell me that everybody's behind it and we'll talk. <laughs> In addition, it would, it, it would take a lot of public review. It would probably take an environmental impact statement. These kinds of drastic measures might be employed in a situation where we had good evidence that deer were impacting uh, an endangered species. but. Peter's work that shows they're impacting a suite of species is probably a little too nebulous to even start that conversation. What about a feeding program? We're trying so hard to get people not to feed wildlife. Uh, it's bad for them, it's bad for us. Uh, most people like to feed deer with things like apples and corn and different grains and they get a condition called um, acidosis and you can actually, while they're gobbling up those treats, uh, they can actually starve to death. It's kind of analogous to if we decided we were going to do nothing but eat chocolate bars. It's not good for them. And it doesn't solve the problem. What about introducing predators? Well, we had a little taste of that this summer. <laughs> um, it, it's a wonderful idea. Uh, on a pure level, but when you introduced humans and all our values and concerns and where we live and the barbecues we leave out and that sort of thing, as we know about the little bear that swam to Orcas this summer, the decision was made to get him off because it was causing a lot of angst in the community. We had another one swim to Vashon Island, it was a cougar, and he was there for quite a while. A uh, young cat, which is typical, it's usually the younger ones that are kicked out by the older ones and they go walk about and find an empty place. We ended up killing him because he started preying on um, people's pet livestock, llamas and donkeys. And cougars become pretty good and pretty adept at specializing on um, a particular organism when they find out that it's easy pickings. So socially, you, I'd like to know what you all think. Um, Introducing predators to the islands, something that the public would tolerate in this day and age. So here are our predator choices. <laughs> uh, we kill 75 animals a year out here with our cars. Uh, that's from the public works guys and they haven't given me the exact orcas figures yet because I called them at kind of the last hour and asked. Um, we can hunt them. And we do have a few predators. Bald eagles might take a very tiny fawn. 
Um, but most of the bald eagle predation you're going to see on deer are going to be snacking on the roadkills by the side of the road. It's a carrion feeder, it's a generalist, um, but it really can't kill a deer unless it's a very small newborn fawn. So pretty negligible, negligible as a predator. So we know that well-intentioned decisions have consequences to the ecosystem. And in this case, it's all of us moving in and adapting our lifestyles to the islands and the history of our ancestors um, who rightly or wrongly decided that predators were not something they were going to tolerate in the islands. Um, just a real quick case study. This is something I'm beginning to work on quite intensively. This is the island marble butterfly. Uh, it was rediscovered in the 90s after having been thought to be extinct um, since the 1920s. The last one was seen on Vancouver Island in the 1920s. Uh, it's now only on San Juan Island. Um, it was for a brief period of time also on Lopez Island and its um, habitat and its the areas where it occurs is shrinking. And it's um, been founded uh, as warranted for listing under the Federal Endangered Species Act and I expect in the next year to two, probably closer to one year, it will be listed under by the federal government as either threatened or endangered. Well the two chief predators on the island marble are spiders and deer. The island marble lays its eggs, there's its caterpillar, on um, the flowers of uh, about three different plants, but the, the, the major one is actually an exotic uh, field mustard. And the deer come along and they eat the eggs and they eat these tiny cal caterpillars. Now spiders are also a problem and Peter has a paper on the impacts of deer on the insect community and what he's found is just as reducing foliage uh, through deer eating it has damaged um, the diversity of the plant community and the bird community, it has also had that effect on the, um, the insect community and so that's kind of got me wondering when the diversity of insects available goes away do spiders, which normally would prey on a different insect type, have to go and choose things like butterfly caterpillars because that's kind of all that's left for them or, or there are fewer choices out there. Um, there's a spider expert at the UW who swears up and down that spiders do not prey on Euchloe, which is the genus of the island marble butterfly. But we know, um, we have very good evidence that that's not the case. What about fencing deer out? Well, one of the things we've found with the island marble is that when you fence them, this is uh, in San Juan Island National Park, and this is a deer fence to try and protect the mustard from deer predation. But turns out there are certain types of fences that this butterfly will actually avoid. So fencing is not always the right answer. It may in fact deter some animals from going into the places, insects in particular, uh, into your garden or into the places that you tried to fence deer out. So our attitudes matter. We are part of the ecosystem. What we do has impact and we have choices. Um, and we are definitely part of the landscape. So we have a choice, somewhat. Um, we can live with fences and we can live with uh, no tree regeneration in our forests which our forests are telling us, even our conifer forests are really struggling because the deer are cropping them before they can reach any kind of height. And I'm going to stop there and see what you think. <laughs> Questions? So Ruth, uh, in your discussion of predators, you left out coyotes. Right. Which are showing up in some of the islands. And I'm wondering if they're having any impact on, on Greenness and Lummi. Um, and they're now on Cyprus, I'm told, too. Right. Uh, you know, it's a pretty small animal. Again, they could take a few deer. 
Uh, coyotes are rampant on Whidbey and on Vashon. They're, you know, high populations of them. And um, we haven't really seen any impact there. I, I think they could have some modest impact, but um, if you're preying on the fawns, and the fawns are dying anyway, that's probably not the way to control the population. You kind of have to prey on the adults, which is what a healthy cougar, uh, even a bear, and wolves certainly, that's their preferred food. So, other questions? Uh-huh. You guys have a, kind of like a depredation permit? We do have a depredation permit. Um, it is, uh, it's a little bit complex. It's not available to just anyone. Um, you have to be a commercial producer in the agricultural business. And I, I can't remember if it's a thousand or three thousand dollars a year income from your agricultural practices that you have to show. Uh, it does not apply to timber growers. So people that are trying to get forest regeneration are not eligible. And basically what it does is it gives a couple of tags to the landowner. Um, but it does not give them carte blanche to take out, you know, the whole group of animals. And I will say on the subject of herds, I'm starting to think of deer in the islands as herds. I was on um, San Juan a month ago or so at dusk, and I drove by a pasture and there were 45 deer in that pasture, something you never see on the mainland with, with blacktails. And I think it's just there are so many of them and they're so nutritionally challenged that they're actually kind of changing behavior a little bit. Another question. I live in Santa Barbara for half the year. We have a huge infiltration of wild boar. And I, I'm one of the hunters for the, for the depredation permits down there. And uh -huh. been like, in some cases, like, 500 war on one piece of land. Wow. We end up having to set up traps, but it's worked really well because it locally, you know, it makes, it brings localization to the herds that come in. And you can, with a trap, get quite a few animals right. out of that general area, which can be beneficial, it has been beneficial. To me. Um, you know, I'm hoping to work with Dr. Long to, um, to do some testing of what we think is probably pretty solid theory. Um, and Peter alluded to this in, in his talk. Um, he mentioned that on some of these islands, the predators would have knocked out the deer and it took, uh, what do you say, in some case decades for them to come back. This is because of that hesitancy. Most people think, you know, if I kill this group of deer, it's the bathtub. Somebody else is just going to pour in. Deer behavior does not support that. So if you can, like your boars, if you can remove a lot of them from one area, um, you'll get five years and maybe decades before that population will build up again. Um, it's theory, it's based on Alaska and whitetail work in the east, but we're pretty sure it would hold in, in these island settings. Comments, questions? Com I have a question. Uh, we're uh, fairly new to the island, and we live on the other side of Moran, and we have a number of deer uh, that um, look like white tailed deer, but they have a lot of white. Uh, and I, 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 I glossed over um, that slide I showed of the, um, we were talking about nutrition and fawns and that sort of thing. Two possibilities. Um, there is a, a recessive gene that produces piebald deer, so they have white spots on their bodies and they're perfectly healthy, normal, it's just one of those things that pops up. The slide I showed you there with the white patches, uh, that's the hair loss syndrome. And that's uh, this bizarre, not even in, still not really well understood um, disease, basically, that deer get. It's caused by, the, the white patches are the, caused by an exotic louse that builds up on the animal's skin, causes intense itching. The animal licks and licks and licks and basically licks its fur off, uh, the pelage off there. So in worst case scenarios, they'll be bald. And then um, 
what comes in with that is a host of, uh, there's a pneumonia, there's a muscle parasite. Um, it kills fawns. Most adults can kind of get through it. It'll hit an area really hard and then it'll move on. Probably related to animals that are living in close proximity um, where these louse can be spread, lice can be spread. Um, they're probably they're probably this recessive gene, and um, yeah, I've got one in my back pasture that it's just I've never seen one in my place before, but they do crop up. Yeah. Could that also be just because of the stress of their life? They're more susceptible to these parasites. Oh, I'm sure. I, you know, I I'm sure. You know, because all wild animals care. Well, the vets here, but they all have parasites of one sort or another and they encounter them and a healthy animal just fends them off and deals with them. And Are there any historical incidences of one of these things wiping out a, a population in a location? And sort of like a wildfire sense of... Not in western Washington that I'm aware of. Are you... Um, no, so there's two things. There's the parasitism malnutrition. And it makes sense that the more deer you have at higher density, the easier it is for them to transmit parasites and then the less forage they have available so the harder time they have in their immune system dealing with them. So that's that's one thing. The other thing as far as the other diseases go, there there are viruses, epizootic hemorrhagic disease, blue tongue virus, uh, adenovirus um, that have come into areas and, and, and can really hit a population hard, um, but uh, I think the only time places in Washington they've really had like in the Okanagan and, and farther in eastern Washington. Yeah, it's east, it's it yeah, it's so down it's, in Clickitat County it's right now. No, and not yeah. much old, yeah. not, 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 nothing that we know about yeah. that cycles through. Not like December with raccoons. Or right, anything. right. Are there any places you know of where there are effective controls being implemented that don't seem to balance herds? I mean, models that we could emulate here. Off the top of my head, no. Um, I, and quite honestly, I'm not that familiar with all the trials and tribulations in the East. Um, white-tailed deer in the East have just skyrocketed. Um, we were talking at dinner, I think it's Minneapolis years ago actually instituted legal hunting within the city limits because the deer population was so high. Um, they have, uh, you know, they, they've got a longer history with this than I do. Um, what kinds of control programs they've, they've tried that have worked, I don't know. Um, I do know the, the different kinds of sterilization experiments. Nobody wants to go there. They just, they just have not done what people would like them to do. Um, and in the East, they have Lyme disease. And so there's a higher public tolerance of activities that would curtail deer numbers because there's a direct threat to human health. We have Lyme disease here, but it's, um, it's not nearly as pronounced. And um, we think that's because the tick that is notorious in the East either doesn't occur or is rare here. Yes? Um, you said that if you get rid of deer, they're not likely to other deer aren't likely to come in. So let's say you had some property and you just wanted to like, chase them out of your yard by yelling at them or whatever. <laughs> Is it likely they would go away and not come back? No. <laughs> no. Um, so, you know, they, uh, animals learn just like we learn. And it doesn't take long to figure out that the person that's chasing them, um, you know, is not going to do them bodily harm. And so they'll come back. And again, um, there's documentation of black tailed deer sitting on their home range in their little tiny patch where there's nothing to eat and starving to death before they'll leave completely. Um, and I, you know, my husband shoots them out of our back pasture with a pellet gun. And when he first started, you know, they'd startle and run away. And now they just turn and look at him because they recognize that it's going to sting, but it's not going to kill me. So, you know, this is much better eating. <laughs> Yes. Assuming you're successful with whatever program you use to diminish the deer population, 
Do you foresee or some of the unintended consequences of a decreased deer population? I don't see a lot of unintended bad consequences. Um, uh, I see a rebounding of um, vegetative communities and the species that rely on them now. We might end up with plant uh, arrays that maybe are less desirable because plants, some plants compete better with others. Um, I should mention the reason hunting isn't working out here if I didn't, if I wasn't clear, and the reason we haven't reduced the population with hunting as a tool is because of the private lands ownership out here. Um, I just cannot find enough places for enough people to go uh, to kill enough deer to make a difference. I'm not a hundred percent convinced that we could ever reduce the deer population with hunting as a tool alone. Um, one idea somebody suggested is, well, why don't you let hunters buy a license and take five deer instead of one? Or your second tag lottery, let them take three or four instead of one. And the reason that's not gonna go anywhere right now is because <clears throat> Let's go back to the king's game and who owns and who has rights to the land and who has rights to the, to the game. If you're the person that owns the property or your uncle does and you know where to go, you get five deer. I live off island and would love that opportunity, but I don't know anybody. That's not a fair and equitable way to manage the public resource. It, it really does have to be a relatively level playing field. Um, so right now, because of we can't get enough people out on the landscape to kill enough deer, we're not ever going to reduce the population with hunting. If we could devise a program where we could get more of the public out to kill more deer, we might make a dent in some places. We're never going to reduce it probably totally all over the island. Um, don't really know because we never really tried. You know, um, question. When you're talking about sterilization, you're talking about sterilizing the females. Is there some technical reason why they're not sterilizing the males? Um, my guess is, and this is a guess, and maybe you know more, Joe. I I don't think the um, uh, the tools to sterilize a male short of castration are out there. I think it's easier to develop something that stops estrus than it is to regulate testosterone. I think the other, it's a numbers game also that you can have one male that can mate a lot of different right. females. Great so point. So if you miss one guy, um, then you can, you can the, the risk of missing a few is greater than the risk of, risk of missing a few females. Right. Um, plus, it's 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 probably easier to regulate um, the either with, uh, the hormones that stop pregnancy early on or the ones that stop ovulation. Um, probably, people have, I think invested more time and energy, as Ruth was saying, right. in, in getting those technologies down. Uh, I, I, we'll start here and we'll go this way, I guess. Uh, what food source is lacking here? the deer need to be healthy? Um, understory vegetation. Uh, you know, di different um, uh, salal, salmonberry, the native shrubs primarily, and some forbs. Of course, that's the first to go because that's the preferred food. Um, ocean spray. Uh, Peter's talk, he talks about arbutus. Um, What's the common name of her? Madrona. Uh, Madrona, thank you. Uh, the starts can't get started because the deer crop them down so much. On Blakely Island, one of the, um, um, Mr. Crowley, the individual that owns a large part of the island and donated a large chunk of property to Seattle Pacific U University, would like to start a forestry program. But if you go out there, the conifer trees look like juniper bushes. They've just been cropped and cropped and cropped, and so they're spreading out this way rather than growing up. But uh, okay, so other comments? Uh huh. Uh, what if you were to open up uh, public lands like Turtleback and places where people go? 
Right. We don't personally own the land, so it's not. Uh, it's it's a social decision. Um, the land bank actually, uh, Lopez Hill, which the ba the land bank owns on Lopez, they actually do allow hunting there. Um, that was a DNR, Department of Natural Resources property, which is a state forestry agency, so it was public land. And they made the decision that um, when they took over the property, they would continue to allow hunting there. Um, I have a, a land trust on Whidbey Island, um, purchased a section of land, and they close it because they're private nonprofit. Um, they close it to all public access for um, the two weeks of the modern firearm season and for the early and late archery seasons and they allow only hunters to go there and they took a lot of flack from their donors but they've recognized that this is a habitat management tool for them and they purchased this property for healthy habitat for all the species on Whidbey and that it, the first year was kind of rough now it's just kind of accepted so um, the BLM properties right now, um, uh, Turnpoint and Chadwick Hill and Iceberg, the bigger uh, ownerships in the National Monument, right now that's open to hunting. Um, they're going through their planning process, their natural resource plan, and they've got a lot of comments from the public saying we don't want hunting there. So again, these are social decisions that um, need to be negotiated with all people that are connected with it. Uh, so, uh, what, what about private landowners, if they, uh, why can't it make it easier for them to take deer on their own property at any time of the year? Uh, it gets back to fairness and the public resource. But don't uh, you want to reduce the population of deer? I would love to reduce the population of deer. Give permits? Um, we give damage permits, and well, we. What's the damage permit? The damage permit is what we were talking about earlier. No, I didn't where, understand. Um, if you are an ag person and you can demonstrate that you've got damage to your agricultural crop, we'll give you a couple of permits. What if you just want to grow a garden in it, finding it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's your land. I don't have yeah. a gun, so I'm yeah. not pushing it yeah. myself. Yeah. But I, I, why don't you just give them a permit? Well, we can't. Um, there's no recourse to do that. The, the damage program, what we can and can't do is um, determined by rule, partly by the RCW that the leg legislature crafts. They, they tell us you know, who we can compensate, um, and partly by the commission. But again, I'm a public employee and my ethic is to be fair to all of our constituents. So because you own land, I'm not going to give you five permits to kill deer when you don't own land and you can't have that privilege. It's, it's got to be an even playing field for, for all of us. That doesn't make any sense to me. Doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you have to go to the legislature then and lobby and, and make a case that there's too many deer. And the case we would like to make is we would like more private landowners to give more hunters access. Um, that is fairer than giving somebody who owns property an advantage that somebody who doesn't own property can't have access to. So I can understand that to a point, but the fairness can be um, I would think mitigated by the need. And if you have a lot of damage being done to the environment in this one particular area, then just because you don't want to be unfair to people that live in areas that don't have this environmental impact, doesn't seem to make sense. And you also said that landowners here wouldn't do that anyway. They wouldn't, they don't want hunters on that land. It's been a real tough sell for me. Um, if you guys have ideas for changing that attitude, I would be uh, very open to hearing it. But. Maybe, maybe a meme? <laughs> <laughs>
so things like this, this education is really, because I'm a deer lover. I love having the deer in my yard. In fact, the joke around Deer Harbor is that the way to, to hunt deer is with an apple and a hammer. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're just, but there's so many of them. I mean, Deer Harbor is appropriately named. Um, but, so education like this, to let people know the actual impact that it has on the environment, education is the key to help change the mindsets. You're not going to change everybody's mindsets, mm -hmm. but if people are reasonable, they should be able to see that common area and that common ground that, you know, you can still love them, but you don't have to have 50 of them in your yard. <laughs> and you shouldn't feed them. And you shouldn't feed them, right. So, let's see, the gentleman with the beard back here, and then... I agree with the previous comment. That I, I just don't understand the concept of hunter equity. Uh, as opposed to uh, population control and principles of scientific population management. It seems to me that should be overriding. Is equity enshrined somehow in law? And, and, and also, particularly if there are no hunters, or if there are not enough hunters, um, it, it, it seems like the way to, to put the issue in the public eye would be to do a census no matter how hard it is. I mean, you mentioned at some point that you think that the deer population in the islands is about 10 times the historic population. Don't know what that's based on, but if that's true, that's very significant. And, and if that were uh, broadcast to the public and the effect of that, um, I, I think people would begin to think about it. Uh, Emery, and then we'll go back over here. Just to, to follow up on that point, it seems that you know, people who live here in the islands and they do own land and they do struggle to have a garden or to be a farmer, um, the equitable aspect of it doesn't really seem to apply if somebody's coming from the city and doesn't have the burden of dealing with the deer and trying to scratch out a garden or an orchard or whatever it might be. And what about an experimental process of opening a window to see how it works and issuing county residents two tags instead of one and encouraging hunting here and, and bypassing the bias against off-island hunters. I, I guess I'd have to talk with people who have more power than me. Uh, the question is, is there a law that says we have to be fair? Not that I've seen, it's sort of um, implied in the whole concept of wildlife belonging to all of us. And, and so built into that idea is the idea that all of us have equal opportunity to use that resource. Um, I can look into whether we could do something special for the county uh, or, you know, if you own land, um, you get more tags than someone else. I cannot imagine, that would be a rule that our Wildlife Commission would have to pass and when they pass rules, there is a public process so anyone can come and tell them what they think about a proposed action. I'd be, I, I don't know, I would be really interested to see what individuals from all over the state of Washington might say to that. You know, uh, I guess when confronted with the, the price tag of having the state come in and do some sort of a large scale state management program, they would be thrilled to encourage individuals to go out and do the job for them. They would, uh, who would be? The state would. Oh yeah, yeah. Joe, jo, did you want to help me out here? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I had two points. Um, to uh, help with the fairness, what if what if the uh, hunters, you know, had a portion of the meat sold maybe at farmers markets? That's just an idea. Another one is uh, I'm, I have a business as a beekeeper, and um, would it be considered a threat to 
my agriculture if my bees can't find forage because there's, they eat all of it. So I, I have to feed my bees every year because they can't find enough food. Yeah, right now that's, it's probably a little too, um, it's not a straight enough, direct enough link um, as far as the damage goes. Um, over here? I'm curious as to whether or not there are any health regulations that would prohibit landowners from having hunters come in and having the deer meat donated to food banks. No. Um, to your point about selling it at farmers markets, that's a no-no because we, we have rules that prohibit commercializing on wildlife. That goes back to the, the lessons we learned from market hunting, basically. That's where that comes from. My follow-up question is, is, would it be possible then to provide some sort of tax incentive to the landowners to bring hunters in to call the deer to donate the food to the land, to the food banks. I love that idea. Uh, taxes, of course, as you know, that's that's the county would have to um, approve that. But that that's a really interesting idea. Then we could just have a party every year, and the hunters could come over from the mainland, shoot to their heart's desire. We give all the money to the people who need the food to eat anyway. We kill two birds with one stone. Yeah, yeah. So talk to your county. Commissioners, councilmen. Yeah. Over here? Yeah. Um, have any of the deer in western Washington been identified as having uh, any of the prion diseases? You know, the, the uh, oh, uh, chronic wasting disease? Chronic wasting right. right. Right, right. Uh, no. Um, we, we had pretty intensive surveillance um, several years ago where we sectioned out lots and lots of brain stems and everything came back negative. The rules for bringing um, hunted meat, uh, deer and elk into Washington changed. And so now you can't bring, um, and you have to bring dressed out packaged meat um, because we know that it exists in um, other states, so. And that, when that was going on, we also worked with the road crew. We sampled quite a few uh, brain stems from hit by car deer uh, um, in, uh, on Orcas Island as part of that study as well. Uh, just a quick comment and a question. We recently purchased 80 acres just outside of towns, and we had a lot. We had a lot of deer on our property. We we enjoyed having our you know, campgrounds. We enjoyed having our campers seeing the deer. They loved the deer. At the same time. I was a school bus driver, and I know about the dangers of having so many deer on this island. It's a huge danger. My question is, we've had a couple of hunters call us and ask if they could come and hunt on our land. We said no, because we're not educated. You know, we have not understood, I mean, we don't like hunting things like on your list, but at the same time, I'm seeing the bigger picture of that something has to be done. But so how do we find out how that works? And when a hunter calls you and says, when we hunt your land, do you just say yes, or is there some process? Or? It, it's up to you. Um, the, there is a law in this state that uh, relieves the landowner of any liability uh, if they allow hunting on their property. So if someone got hurt, if the person broke their leg falling on your land while hunting, you are exonerated. You are not liable. So you can simply say, here's what I want. You know, come out on Saturday, we'll have a cup of coffee, I want to meet you. Um, or you can say, you know, and I'll give you my written permission. I mean, it's, it's really up to you. Or you get that thousand dollar. Or you can work with us, day. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, question. How did it come about that, uh, I guess it was a couple of years ago, that it's okay now to harvest roadkill? Uh, I, I think that was basically, yeah, you can. Um, we call it the Buick tag, but um, <laughs> you have to purchase a tag, I think, within 24 hours of, of claiming the animal. Um, public request. 
you know, uh, enough people saw enough things on the side of the road that were in good shape and wished they could take them. And um, uh, which is really getting back to the our fairness discussion over here. Uh, if it's a good idea and you really want it to happen, um, you want to work with me to propose it and discuss it with our wildlife commission. I, I'm not optimistic about um, landowners getting a special number of, of tags, but I'm open to, uh, we could try it, we could make a run at it. I, I don't think it's a matter of the landowner getting more tags. I think it's a matter of everybody being able to, to get more tags and allowing people to hunt on the property. Well, this is what I want. I would like more people enrolled in our private lands access program. Um, it's up to you as to who comes and how many and when and all that sort of stuff. Um, I would love to see that program take off in the islands. And um, uh, the reasons I set forward are the, those are comments from people that we've uh, approached and asked if they would like to enroll in the program. So, you know, if we had a really robust access program out here, then I would be more than happy to try and get the commission to approve two deer on your second tag or two deer on your first tag or whatever. Um, but we would have to have more access for the public, more opportunity for everybody. So, uh, question, Is comment? Is there a way to lower the standards of kind of the regulatory system of the type of farm for, for that kind of a depredation permit? work here? Like if let's say, you know, Emory has a farm on his little, on his little road and it's, it maybe doesn't make a lot of money a year, but it is supporting like the farmer's market. And you know, is there a way that maybe there could be a standard lowering of like how much you produce to be able to get some kind of a permit that would enable you to be able to take enough deer to make a difference? Uh -oh. You know, I, I confess um, our damage guy is never in the office and I'm not super familiar with that program. So um, maybe what I can do is get something to Joe that outlines that program and he can put it on the CDOC website um, to make sure that I'm telling you precise and accurate information and to get you more information about it. We have... Um, one guy in the north end of our region. So the region four, which is the, um, the region I work in, runs from King County to the Canadian border. And we've got one guy that handles ungulate damage for the north end. Um, and we have a, a very contentious, very difficult issue with too many elk in the valley floor of the Skagit Valley. And he spends all his time on that. Um, but I, he would be more than happy to come out and meet with people too, I know, so. So it's about 7.20, and I hate to cut this short, but I, I want to say thank you for a civil discourse. It's not something that happens in our society often, and I'm super proud of everybody tonight. I want to do another round of applause for Ruth for taking time. Thank you. And I hope the conversation uh, continues um, in, in a civil way as well, and if there's Anything that, that we can do as far as, I mean, CDOC is a science program, even though we're a marine program, but there are some of these uh, papers or things like that that people are interested in. I really feel like science is of no good if people can't get access to it. So, you, you know, and, and sometimes you get online and you find you have to pay $55. Just call and say, hey, Joe, can you send me that paper? And we just, <laughs> we'll send it to you as a PDF. It's not a problem. But thank you all for coming out tonight. Thanks again, Ruth. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.